Good day all. Uh, welcome once again to my YouTube channel. It's been a while, but we are back. Now, I'll be going through a series of question videos on um, chemistry. And for those of you that are writing Unibank for CTME and UBTH, this will be very, very important for you guys. So I'll be running through about 20 questions in chemistry. So do well to pay attention as I run through these questions without wasting further time. All right, question one. The lactanite and actinite are located in which block of the periodic table? The lactanite and actinite are located in which block of the periodic table? Well, we, when you study your periodic table, you get to know that uh, the complete blocks of elements of the periodic table, uh, you have the arrangements in groups and in periods. And there are some elements that are not present in the block of the periodic table. They are just below the elements that are present in the block. So those elements, they are considered as the lactanite and the actinite series, all right? And these elements are regarded as inner transition elements. They are called the F-block elements. Why are they called the F-block elements? It's because their orbital representation ends in the F orbital. Of course, we have four types of orbitals. We have the S orbital, which is also known as the sharp orbital. We have the P orbital, the principal. We have the D orbital, diffuse. And then we have the F, fundamental. So these elements, Elements in this series are actually regarded as what the F block elements. When I say lactanite, I'm referring to elements uh, that is in the series of the first element called lactanum, and then it ends in lutetium. Then while this one, the actinite, it is from the element that begins the series. The element is called actinium, and it ends with uh, laurentium. All right. So they are regarded as F block elements. So the correct answer is option C. Question two. What is the valency of an element with the electronic configuration 287? Electronic configuration 287. It therefore implies that uh, the first share will take two electrons, the next takes eight electrons, then uh, the last takes seven, seven electrons. All right, seven electrons. So it's obvious that the element here is chlorine, having the atomic number 17. All right, but now the question is, is a tricky one at that. They said, what is the valency? When we talk about valency, we are not referring to valence electrons because I guess so many students will be tempted to go in with option A. But they are not referring to valence electrons because uh, you must understand that there is a difference between valency, valence electrons, valence electrons, and oxidation number. All right, so please. We must take cognizance of what I'm about to say now. Valency simply means the combining power of an element. Valence electrons is known as the outermost shear electrons. And oxidation number is known as the charge an element carries or possesses. But let me break something down about valency and oxidation number. Because that of valence electrons is very easy for you to tell. Because it is the outermost shear electrons, meaning the electrons that are located in the outermost shear. We are having three shares here, K, L, and M. The outermost shear electrons here happens to be what? Seven. So they didn't say the valence electrons, they said valency. And valency by definition, which is the combining power of an element, uh, breaking that down simply means the number of electrons an element needs to lose or to gain to become stable, to obey the octet rule of stability, having eight, eight electrons in its outermost share. So looking at uh, this element, it has seven in its outermost share. So for it to obey the octet rule of stability, it has to gain one. So gaining one here, that one means the valency, all right? So if, for example, you have an element that has the electronic configuration 281, which is sodium 11. Now, this guy needs to donate its one in order to have it in its outermost share. So donating this one, it still remains its valency. So accepting one still remains valency. So the valency is simply the number of electrons an element needs to lose or to gain to become stable. So in this case, this element needs to gain one to become stable. Hence, one is the valency. Valence electrons is what? Seven. Then oxidation number is simply valency plus charge. It is oxidation number that explains more about valency. How? Now, I said something about valency that it is the number of electrons an element needs to lose or to gain to become stable. In this case, this guy is actually gaining one electron. And for you to gain, you must uh, become an ion. And that kind of ion would not be negatively charged ion. Why? Because you are gaining. That's under electronegativity, the ability of an element to gain electron and become negatively charged, all right? So in this case, this guy needs to gain one, and that gain of one is actually what? Minus 
minus 1. So hence, the oxidation number here is minus 1, the valence is 1, and valence electrons is 7. So now, can I as well say that oxidation number is simply valence plus charge? That's it. Oxidation number is equal to valency, valency plus charge. Exactly. All right? So the correct answer to this question now is what? One, because we are asked for valency. Question three. For question three, we were told that a gas occupies a volume of 1.5 liters at a pressure of 2 atm. If the pressure is increased to 4 atm while the temperature remains constant, what will be the new volume of the gas? Looking at this question, we are given two entities. And if you check, the two entities that we are given are pressure and um, temp not temperature uh, volume because we are told that the temperature is kept constant. All right? So we are given volume and we are given uh, pressure. Then we are told to calculate volume. Now, uh, which law among the gas laws can you think of that you are told that um, there is a certain entity or quantity that is kept constant and that quantity happens to be temperature? If you think thoroughly, you get to know that it is Boyce's law. Because Boyce's law states that the volume of a given or fixed mass of gas is inversely proportional to its pressure, provided the temperature is kept constant or remains constant. So in this case, we are giving volume and pressure, so we can work with the formula. Now, the formula for calculating uh, Boyce's law is given as P1V1 is equal to P2V2. P1V1 is equal to P2V2. So in that case, we can as well write the formula P1, V1 equal to P2, V2. Now, of course, what's our pressure? 1, 2 atm. We are giving 2 atm as P1. Then we are giving the first volume there, that's V1, was 1.5 liters. That is uh, V1. And then we are told to calculate the volume. V2 is unknown. V2 is unknown. Then why the P2, which is the next pressure, was um, 4. All right, so the next pressure is 4 atm. So it means we just plunge in these values into it. Because the first time pressure is 2, then times V1, which is 1.5. 1.5 is 3 over 2, then equal to then P2. P2 is 4, then times V2. V2 is x, which is the unknown value we are told to find. So these two can cancel out, and then we are left with 3 at the other side. So 3 equal to what? 4x. So that should be 3 over 4. And of course, when you carry out the division, it should give 0 0.75. So the correct answer is C, 0 0.75. Then let's quickly look at the next question. The next question is, what, which of the following, that's number 4, which of the following methods can be used to remove temporary hardness from water? Which of the following methods can be used to remove temporary hardness from water? How do we go about that? Now, there's something you should know. Under water, we, we, we know a particular concept known as hardness of water. Now, when we say water is hard, it means that uh, it does not easily lather or foam with soap. There are two types of hardness of water. We have the temporary, we have temporary hardness of water, and then we have permanent hardness of water. Temporary hardness of water and permanent hardness of water. Now, the thing is this. One very vital thing that you need to take on business of is this, that temporary hardness is called temporary because it can easily be removed by boiling, meaning that the substances that causes temporary hardness, they are unstable to heat. When heat is applied, they get decomposed. And of course, the ion responsible for causing the hardness can be easily filtered because there will be a precipitation of the salt that you can easily filter out because it is insoluble. All right, you can take out the ions. Because you know the two main ions that are responsible for hardness are calcium ion and magnesium ion. But there's still another ion that is responsible for hardness that is called ion 2 ion. All right? So take cognizance of that. Compounds that causes temporary hardness of water are the hydrogen carbonates of calcium and magnesium, CAHCO32 and MGHCO32. All right? So these are the two compounds that can cause temporary hardness. For permanent hardness, they can be caused by calcium sulfate, uh, magnesium sulfate, um, magnesium chloride, calcium chloride, and even iron sulfate. All right? So these are compounds that can cause 
permanent hardness. So these compounds, when, when heat is applied, they are unstable to heat. So hence, that's the reason why they can easily be removed by boiling. Because when you boil, you apply what? Heat. All right? So the correct answer is boiling. Boiling. It can remove temporary hardness. Then number, number five. We are told to identify the reducing agent in the following reaction. Identify the reducing agent in the following reaction. And then the reaction there that is written is zinc reacting with copper sulfate. And then to produce zinc sulfate and copper being released. Now this reaction is actually a displacement reaction because zinc was able to remove copper in this reaction and they picked up um, SO4 to form zinc SO4 while copper is left alone. When I say displaced, it means it's able to remove, all right? So now, looking at this reaction, Zn plus CuSO4 to give ZnSO4 plus Cu. How do we identify our reducing agent from this reaction? Because this is a redox reaction. Redox reactions often involve reducing and oxidizing agents, um, you know, reacting together. Now, how do you tell if a substance is the reducing agent or the oxidizing agent? Now, the thing is this. Any substance that is reduced at the end of a redox reaction is called an oxidizing agent. Any substance that is oxidized at the end of a redox reaction is called the reducing agent. Please take note of what I just said now. So now, looking at this, we can as well tell that from this reaction, the oxidation state of zinc here is zero, while the oxidation state of zinc here is plus two. So if you should move from zero to plus two, of course, you know that when you are increasing to the positive value, you are, you are trying to show that there's oxidation that has taken place. Because oxidation is loss of electron. Oxidation is loss of electron. The while reduction is gain of electron. That's the another definition of um, reduction and oxidation. So oxidation is loss and reduction is gain of electron. Because you can use this code to remember it. Oil rig. Oil rig, which is oxidation is loss and reduction is what? Gain of electrons. So you can even use this number line to represent, to be able to easily get your answer correctly. Now, if you are moving to this direction, let me just write it. I use this code to attempting questions when it comes to this, to be very easy. All right? So when you are coming to this direction, that's oxidation. Oxidation. Then when you are moving to the other direction, this one is reduction. All right? Reduction. Because when you talk about gain of electrons becoming negatively charged, that is reduction, which is gain, and going to the positive, that's oxidation. So just picture it this way, that we are moving from zero to plus two. Zero to plus two is to this direction, which is oxidation. So it means that zinc was oxidized, all right? And any substance that is oxidized at the end of the redox reaction is called what? The reducing agent. So of course, this is the reducing agent. You can remember this number line. If it is going to this direction, it means the substance will be reduced. And when the substance is reduced, it means that substance is the oxidizing agent. So that's how it basically works, all right? So let's not waste much time on that. And the answer to this question is B. Another way, another very easy way for you to identify oxidizing or reducing agents is you eliminating the first two options. How? How do you eliminate options? This is it. If you are given the reaction, just eliminate the options in the right-hand side after the arrow, meaning the product, because you cannot obtain your oxidizing or reducing agent from the product. So it therefore implies that if I want to eliminate first two options, it should be option containing Z and SO4 and option containing what? Cu. So it will be easier for me to even select in my answer. You get the point? All right. So that's that about that. Then let's forge ahead to the next question. Question six. What is the IUPAC name for the compound CCL4? CCL4. That's the IUPAC name of the compound CCL4. Now, this compound is coming from CH4, which is methane. Something like this. This is the structural representation of methane. So when you substitute all the hydrogens here with chlorine, 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 and chlorine, you are going to obtain this. So it means that this is actually, it's that you are calling this carbon tetrachloride, or you are calling this uh, tetrachloromethane. All right? But they said IUPAC. So carbon tetrachloride is actually common name. Why chloromet uh, tetrachloromethane is called the IUPAC name. So it means the correct answer is actually option B. There was carbon tetrachloride in option C, but please don't go with that because this is actually common name. But we are interested in the IUPAC name. And of course, uh, you should know the full meaning of IUPAC. International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. Don't forget that. So let's forge ahead to the next question. 
Which of the following mixture is an example of a colloid? When we talk about colloid, we are referring to false solutions. So we have three true solutions and one false solution. The three true solutions are orange juice, salt water, and sugar dissolved in water, which is sugar solution. So it means the only option that makes a lot of sense here is actually what? Uh, milk, all right? Milk. Milk falls under, I think, emulsions. Emulsion is an example of a colloid. And of course, you know, emulsion is simply liquid dispersed in liquid. You can read up stuff like that or watch my previous videos that have explained things with regards to colloids. It's here on this channel, all right? So the next question, question eight. What is the chemical formula of rust, which is formed on the surface of iron in the presence of oxygen and moisture? Of course, you know what rusting is. Rusting is simply the formation of iron three oxide when iron is exposed to damp or moist air. All right? So looking at this, formation of iron three oxide, all you simply just do, this question is so cheap. You just look for the compound that you have the oxidation state of iron to be um, three, and it is an oxide of iron. Of course, the first one here is iron two, three oxide. This one is iron two oxide. This one is iron two hydroxide, while this one is iron three oxide. And what that's about rusting? Rusting is the formation of iron three oxide when iron is exposed to damp or moist air. So the correct answer is option D. All right? Question nine. When an hydrous cobalt chloride paper is exposed to water, what color change is observed? This is under the test for water. Test for water. And there are two paper tests for water. Is that you are using an hydrous, an hydrous copper sulfate paper or you are using an hydrous cobalt chloride paper. All right? Now, if you are using the first, which is an hydrous copper sulfate paper, it changes the color from white, from white to blue. Don't forget this. The white for cobalt chloride paper, it changes it from blue to pink. All right? So we were asked for the cobalt chloride paper. It's from blue to pink. So the correct answer is option D, from blue to pink. All right? Then question 10. Which of the following substances is not hygroscopic? This word, hygroscopic, is coming from the word hygroscopy. That's actually a property of salt. We have three fundamental properties of salt. We have efflorescence, deliquescence, and hygroscopy. When we talk about hygroscopy, we are simply referring to substances that tends to, when exposed to the atmosphere, they tend to absorb water. Full stop. That's it. Meaning that any substance when exposed to the atmosphere is able to absorb water from it. It is called hygroscopic substance. All right? So on careful observation, when you now notice that the substance now dissolved in the already absorbed water, then you no longer call it hygroscopy. You now call it deliquescent because it has dissolved in the already absorbed water to form solution. All right? But when it does not dissolve, then maybe if solid, it only becomes sticky or wet. Of course, that is still hygroscopy. Then there are some liquid substances that are hygroscopic in nature, like concentrated uh, sulfuric acid, which is concentrated H2SO4. When you expose this concentrated H2SO4 liquid form to the atmosphere, it tends to absorb water and make dilute solution of itself. I can say that even it has been recorded that if you have, let's say, 20 mil of concentrated sulfuric acid, when you expose to the atmosphere, it tends to make three times its initial volume of its solution. All right, so it becomes diluted. So that's that about that. So hence, you should take cognizance of the fact that concentrated sulfuric acid is hygroscopic. We still have NaNO3, nano -3, which is sodium nitrate. And then we still have copper oxide. We have calcium oxide. All right. Then all these ones, salt, sugar, silica gel, these ones, they are examples of, uh, of hygroscopic substances. So the only one that is not is what? Aluminium. Aluminium is a metal and not a compound, all right? So that's that about that. So question 11, which organic compound is responsible for the characteristic aroma of fruits? Of course, the options there, we have um, A, alkane, B, alkyne, C, ester, D, amine. It's so obvious that the answer is ester. If you have studied the organic chemistry very well, you get to, that's organic chemistry too. You get to know that the esters are known for their characteristic fruity smell, all right? So it is actually the ester, not the alkane, not the alkyne, and not amine. But as a matter of fact, amines are known to have characteristic fishy smell. All right? So question 12. Which of the following compounds is an example of electrovalent bond? Now looking at these compounds, we have um, A, sodium chloride, B, carbon dioxide, C, water, and D, methane. Now, when you have the coexistence of metal and non-metal together, 
it forms what is known as what electrovalent bond. That adjusts the secret. So in this case, carbon and oxygen, non-metal, non-metal, hydrogen, oxygen, non-metal, and non-metal. Then carbon and hydrogen, non-metal, non-metal. So the only one with metal and non-metal coexistence is actually A. So the correct answer is A. All right. Then question 13. What is the mass in gram of 500 milliliter of ethanol? Density of ethanol is 0 0.789 gram per milliliter. All right, so how do we go about this? Of course, you should know. Density, density is given to be the mass per unit volume of a substance. So mass over volume. Density of the ethanol was given to be 0 0.789. Then the mass wasn't given. We are told to calculate it. While the volume was given to so X over 500 milliliter all right while this one is in gram per milliliter all right so when you cross multiply volume or rather mass is equal to 0 0.789 times 500 it gives you in grams which we ultimately produce i think 394.5 grams so the correct answer is option c if you use your calculator you get that then question 14 when a substance is oxidized it a loses electrons, B, gains oxygen atoms, C, gains electrons, and D, loses protons. The answer is obvious. It is loses electrons. Because now, a substance that is oxidized is undergoing oxidation. And of course, you know what oxidation is. Oxidation. And what is oxidation? Oxidation is what is loss of electrons. All right? So a substance that is oxidized is said to be a reducing agent. And remember that reducing agents, they tend to, what, to give out or donate electrons. So they are electron donors. They donate electrons, all right? So meaning that they lose electrons. They lose electrons, loss of electrons, OK? So the answer to that question is option A. Then question 15. What is the mass percentage? This question, you will need to calculate. The mass percentage of carbon in methane. The mass percentage of carbon in methane. And of course, uh, we are giving the molar mass of carbon to be, to be 12. So we can easily get it. Because now, methane is, methane is CH4. So the uh, molar mass of carbon is 12. So 12 over CH4. So it means you have to get the molar weight of the said element you are told to calculate the percentage. So since it's carbon, it should be carbon over CH, the molar weight of methane, um, then times 100, being that it's percentage. So that of carbon is 12. Methane should be 16, because 12 is, um, carbon is 12. Hydrogen is 1 times 4 is 4. Then 12 plus 4, that's 16, times 100. So when you do that, we are ultimately going to arrive at, uh, when you do the mathematics, you are going to get 75%. By your calculator. Use your calculator, it will give you 75%. All right? Then, if you want to calculate for that of hydrogen, it's going to be hydrogen over CH4, which is methane, times 100. That's how it works. So, for hydrogen, in that compound, that methane, it's, it's actually four atoms of hydrogen. So, that should be four times one. So, here should be four over 16 times 100. I think this will give us 25%. Um, that's the leftover of that uh, 75. All right, so that's how it works. So the correct answer is 75%. Then next, when an acidic solution is diluted, what happens to its pH? Remember, on this pH scale, it ranges from 0 to 14. 7 is neutral. Coming down, there is increase in acidity. Then going up, there is increase in basicity or alkalinity. All right? So it means that the lower the pH value, the higher the acidity. So you add the water. It means that you are definitely going to dilute the acidic solution. That's dilution of acidic solution when you add water to it. So diluting it, we tend to drag the pH and increase it. So it means it will increase towards the region of probably basic or even neutral. So the correct answer is D. It increases the pH value, but it does not reduce it. If it reduces, it means we are increasing the level of acidity. Are you diluting acidic solution? You are not increasing its acidity. All right. I hope that helps. Then question 17. Which group does calcium belong to in the periodic table? If you check your periodic table, you know that the groups are the vertical columns, while the periods are horizontal rows. So, of course, uh, calcium belongs to um, the group 2 elements. And, of course, you know that the group 1 elements, they are called alkali metals, 
group two elements, they are called alkaline earth metals. The white group seven halogens or salt formers, then group eight, noble gases or inert gases or rare gases. All right, so the correct answer is alkaline earth metals, which are the group two elements. But of course, you know that calcium forms two plus. All right, so it's found in group two. Then 18, what is the maximum number of electrons that can occupy the second energy level? This needs to be clearly explained. There's a formula for calculating the maximum number of electrons I can get in an energy level. You see this um, energy level, you shouldn't be confused about it because another name for energy level is known as shells. And shells, they are also called orbits. So don't forget that, all right? So these are other names for each of them. Then, of course, um, we have sub-energy level. Take note of this. Sub-energy level is also known as sub-shells and it's also known as orbitals so never should you say that the short form of orbits is orbitals all right or the short form of orbitals is orbits so please get this thing clearly so of course the um, formula that is used for calculating the maximum number of electrons that a said energy level can accommodate is 2n square 2n square n represents principal quantum number and this n value can range from 1 to infinity all right but the n value here if it is 1 it corresponds to K share. If it is 2, it's L share. If it is 3, it's M share. Just like that. It's a continuous term. So since they said the N value is even stated to be 2, then we can get our answer, which is 2 times 2 squared. That should be 2 times 2 times 2, which is 2 times 2 is 4. 4 times 2 is what? 8. So the answer is 8. As mean N was 3, then it should have been what? 2 times 3 squared. 3 squared is 9. Then 9 times 2 is 18. So that's how you get it. So question 19. Which of the following alkanes has a straight chain structure? It's obvious that this is a cyclic chain, so this is wrong. Then this is isobutane. There is a branch. This branch, meaning uh, two methyl uh, propane, which is two methyl propane. Another name for that isobutane is two methyl propane. That's a branch. All right, something like this, where you're having three carbons linked together, and then you have a branch. So this is two methyl propane. That's a branch chain. Then butane is an ordinary straight chain, something like this having a straight link of carbon. So the correct answer is option C. Of course, benzene is never a member of the alkene. All right, it falls under the aromatic. You know, the alkenes, alkenes, and alkynes, they are under aliphatic, all right? So open chain hydrocarbons. So the correct answer is butane. Then the last question, which is question 20. Question 20 says that, what is the common name for ethanoic acid? What is the common name for ethanoic acid? This is taking our mind to alkanoic acids. And of course, you know that in the alkanoic acid series, you focus more on the first 10 members. The first member of the alkanoic acid happens to be methanoic. We have methanoic all through to decanoic. Methanoic acid is also called formic acid. So methanoic, methanoic is called formic. That's the common name, formic acid. Ethanoic, ethanoic is called acetic, acetic acid. Then propanoic, propanoic is called propionic acid, all right? Then butanoic, butanoic is called butyric, butyric acid. Then pentanoic, pentanoic is called valeric acid. Then um, hexanoic, hexanoic is called carpuric acid. Then um, heptanoic, heptanoic is called enantic enantic then octanoic octanoic is called caprylic then nonanoic nonanoic is called pelagonic pelagonic then decanoic decanoic is called capric all right so it means the correct answer to this question is obvious now is what acetic acid which is option a all right so you can take cognizance of these names they will be of help to you so i hope with these few things that i've just explained it will be of help to those of you that are preparing to write in unibem post tme and as well as the forthcoming ubth school of nursing entrance examination so it's my hope that everything that i've just explained will stick into your memory and you should also read wire read wire to make sure you cover quite a number of things all right so i wish you guys all the best and stay glued to this channel as more will be dropping very very soon thanks for watching and stay blessed